Good morning, Community Church. It's good to see everybody here today. Uh, it was great to pray for our graduating seniors. Um, it was also such a privilege to pray for uh, Adam and Daniel, their transition. Uh, Adam, it's hard to believe he's been here six years. I think that's a national record for youth pastors. So, and I think Daniel's probably the one that's going to beat it. I remember the first time meeting Daniel and hearing his heart of wanting to work uh, in youth ministry. Uh, we are going to pray for some more people. So all the, the people that were recently trained as mental health coaches and recovery coaches, come on up, kind of quick, come on up here, you guys. Appreciate it. All right, let's give them a hand. We have a bunch of people. Look at this. So we received a couple of grants um, to pay for training for these people, either as a recovery coach, which is coming alongside people that are new to recovery or restarting recovery um, from addictions, and then also mental health coaches, which come along people, come alongside people. And whoa, look at all them. So I'm going to step over here. I'm going to try to remember names. Um, so we'll start here. Brad Robertson is working as a mental health coach. We've got Sky Helmick and Justin Helmick, their husband and wife, and their little baby. Everybody just look at that little baby. Aww. And their uh, recovery coaches, John Hartman as a mental health coach, Sharon Newton, who's already started as a mental health coach, Courtney Irvin is a recovery coach. Taylor McCulloch is newly trained. We're thankful for Taylor uh, partnering with us as a recovery coach. Barb Huser as a mental health coach and a recovery coach. She's the training person. Uh, Maria Ostergaard as a recovery coach. Joe Matthew and his wife, Aaron Matthew as recovery coaches. America Palomino, Estefani Flores, Claudia Martinez, oh, yes, and Myrna Escoto, and then also Frank Escoto. So we've been, it's been wonderful to partner with the Hispanic <laughs> Fellowship as well. So this is a ministry to the body here and also to those who maybe don't know Jesus. And so let's pray together as we are commissioning them to go on mission uh, in the name of the Lord. So let's pray together. Father, I thank you for these individuals here on the stage and for their desire to commit time to train and be equipped to minister to other people. And I pray that you would give them wisdom and peace and a lot of joy as they serve. And we're thankful for a church body that embraces this. And so we look forward to what you are going to accomplish as they are called out to partner with you on mission. And we praise you for the abilities that you give us and the gifts and talents. It is in your name we pray. Amen. All right, let's give him a hand. Amen. That's awesome. Just uh, to support each other like that. My name is Scott Hunley. <clears throat> I struggle with attention deficit and anxiety, but that is not where I find my identity. I'm also a husband, a father, a grandfather, a grandfather of two and a third one coming in November, a little girl, had to say that. A father-in-law, I serve as the director of community on town, but I do not find my identity there either. I pray that my identity is found in being a follower of Jesus Christ and a son of God and your brother and sister in Christ. And I pray that each of you find your identity in that as well. We are currently in a sermon series called Finding Clarity. Everybody need to watch me take a drink of water there. Um, the idea is there were topics that, through a survey here in the church, that people maybe were interested in having a little more clarity about. To the opposite of cl uh, clarity is murky or blurry or 
So to clear up uh, maybe some confusion or some understanding. So today it's on mental health. Now mental health is a huge, huge topic. It really could be a series. But, you know, starting to think through and praying about this a couple weeks ago, just a lot of things were coming to mind. So I hope that today there's something for everybody here today. Now think of it as a funnel, like, you know, as a funnel, we're going to talk broad at first and kind of move down to personal application as we go. The vision of our church, and I hope it's been ingrained in your brain, uh, is to see all people thrive in Christ by supporting, encouraging, and equipping them. And that is the vision of our church. And I'm thankful to be a part of a church that embraces emotional and mental health as part of the overall discipleship process. So what's the relationship between our faith and mental health? Well, first, let's start with just kind of defining what mental health is. If you're a human being, you have mental health, just like you have physical health. But I think it's good to look at this definition. It says, our emotional, psychological, and social well-being and how it affects how we think and how we act. How you think drives and affects how you feel, and then how you feel affects your behavior and your actions. Mental health is how you handle stress, how you cope, how you relate to hard times, how you bounce back or don't bounce back, and your relationships with other people. But it can be very confusing on what is mental health. So I think a, a way to describe this is let's just imagine a um, continuum here along the stage. And over here on this end, most of us have had times where we're stressed out or a little sad or a little worried. And so most people have been here at this point. If we take the extreme all the way over to this end of the continuum, we have serious mental illness, like schizophrenia and psychotic disorders. So it's not linear, but there's, it's such a wide uh, topic of mental health. And actually, uh, technically, there are over 300 different diagnoses of different types of mental health or mental illness struggles. Now, we're not going to go through those today, but some of those, for example, anxiety. Anxiety can be here, where it's mild. We struggle with anxiety, mild, or moderate, or severe anxiety, which can show itself in like panic attacks or obsessive compulsive uh, disorder. And then depression, you can have mild, moderate, severe depression. And one form of depression is bipolar disorder, which is uh, a mania paired up with depression. And there's personality disorders and borderline and not talking about eating disorders and addictions and post-traumatic stress, TBI, so many different things fit in the umbrella of mental health. But along this continuum, a lot of trauma may have occurred. Now, I want to make sure to clarify something. Counseling does not necessarily mean mental health issues. Like counseling we provide can be for marriage or helping someone work through forgiveness or working through a career change. It's not all mental health related, but a lot of it is. Let's look at the statistics before we go on. 20% of all Americans experience a mental health condition in a given year. Anxiety is the number one issue for women and the number two for men. 25% of all women ages 16 to 24 report self-harming at least once, such as cutting. This is sobering. Uh, suicide is the second leading cause of death for 12 to 24-year-olds nationally. And finally, this is based on Barna research from 2023, that 65% of all pastors feel isolated and lonely. So we can't argue that mental health is a concern for our nation, but also here in Bethlehem County. <clears throat> 
Now, I'd like to pause right there on that, and I'd like to look at the life of Jesus. I think it's important that if we claim to be followers of Jesus Christ, we are claiming to be disciples of Jesus. And to be a disciple of Jesus, we learn from Jesus, right? So let's look at Luke chapter 4, verse 18. I call this Jesus' mission statement. When he came and revealed himself publicly for the first time in the temple, this is what he said. And he's quoting from um, a prophecy in the book of Isaiah. The spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor to set the oppressed free. And I love uh, how it's worded in the version of the message, to set the burdened and the battered free. You see, Jesus came to help and heal and support and transform people that were struggling. If you look in the scriptures, that's where he spent his time, with the people in the margins, the people that were struggling, the people that were poor, not the people that had it all together or thought they had it all together. That's where he spent his time. So if he is um, who we model our life after, I think we need to remember that. Now Jesus was fully human and fully God. But do you know what? Jesus had emotions. We don't think about that very often, do we? He had emotions. He cried, he wept, he had joy, he got angry, he grieved, sadness came over him, he felt sorrow, and the night before he's crucified, he had distress. And scripture says, soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. He wasn't afraid to express his emotions. Men, do you hear that? Okay. He was without sin. So our emotions are very real. We are created as emotional people. It's part of who we are, and that's okay. We were not created as robots or puppets. We are people with emotions and feelings. But with feelings, something that I think is very important is that feelings are not always reliable. We can't always trust our feelings. We must look at the truth to discern the feelings. Now I wanna share with you two common myths that I believe have been told through the years when it comes to faith and mental health. And I wanna challenge these myths, and I hope this is helpful for you. All right, myth number one is that faith and psychology don't mix. Faith and psychology don't mix. So we'll go back to this continuum example I gave to to explain maybe a little bit of this. So over here, um, way to the extreme are people who believe that the Bible is all you need to grow. Now, please understand me. The Bible is true. The Bible is the word of God. It is what we need in our life to be more like Christ and to understand God. But sometimes there's no recognition for anything else that we learn and know through studies and science. Just read the Bible, do what the Bible says, and you'll be okay. Now, over on this extreme, especially in today's society, we have secular psychology that will, through science, will not uh, integrate faith and does not recognize faith as anything valid. And I'm talking extreme. Do you know that up until probably 1900 or the 1800s, churches were responsible for most of the church or hospitals? hospitals, orphanages, and also the care of people that were struggling with mental health issues, the churches. 
But what happened was there was a man by the name of Sigmund Freud, as well as others, if you've heard of Freud, he was an atheist. He was very popular. He came on the scene and basically said, religion, those people who believe in religion and faith are neurotic. And that's what he said. And people started believing him. And they suffer from disillusionment and hysteria. How's that for you? All right? So the separation happened. This camp doesn't trust this camp. This camp doesn't believe this is even valid. But faith plays a huge, significant role in mental health issues. Studies and data now show that people who have a very sincere, valid faith and live it out have much better chances and a quicker recovery from mental health issues and a hope for change. And that's just not us saying that because we're Christians, but there are studies by people who aren't Christians that are saying, yes, this is valid. And I think it's a revelation to our society. So sometimes these two camps can work together, but it's complicated. Let's talk about the brain and the mind, okay? The brain is a three-pound mass inside your head. And everybody, well, I hope everybody here in this room has one, <laughs> all right? Three-pound mass. It is a physical organ like your heart, your lungs. It has a job to do. And the brain's job is to support the mind. God created our brains. He created this idea of mind. I like to think of the brain as the hardware of a computer. The mind is the software. Millions and millions of crazy connections have started while you were even in your mother's womb. Of the brain connecting. Synapses produces serotonin and hormones, uh, endorphins, dopamine, memory. Literally millions of connections going on every minute in your brain. All of creation from God. Now the mind, which the brain supports, gives us the ability to think and feel and engage, communicate and relate. So you got the brain and you got the mind. Well, Jesus had something to say about the mind. And so we're going to look at Matthew 22, 37. Very well-known scripture. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your, what's the word? Mind. With all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. Love the Lord your God with your mind. Have you thought about that? When you came into worship this morning, we sang four songs. Did you sing songs or did you worship? There's a difference. Probably 25, 30 years ago, I heard someone use this as a description for worship. Worship is filling your mind with thoughts about the goodness of God. Isn't that good? Filling your mind with thoughts of the goodness of God. So think about that next week when we gather again for worship. Now, let's talk a little more about the brain and the mind. And I'm going to geek out here just a little bit, so hold on. We have neural pathways. These are connections that attach meaning and signals in our brain. For example, a baby and its mother, a newborn baby and its mother, starts connecting. This is the provider right? This person loves me. And we have all these neural pathways that are going on up here unconsciously as we grow and as we mature. They develop automatic thoughts. Sometimes they can be good, sometimes they can be bad. If I were to be on a hillside with a fire hose and uh, run the fire hose down a hillside, if I continue to do that for days and days and days, what happens? A rut, right? and a stream. So it, things will take the path of least resistance. And that's what happens 
in our brains. We start creating these pathways that we begin to believe as truth. For me, let me give you an example. There's something that humans do that I think is super, super weird. And they do it with their hands. It's called tickling. Now think about it. People go up and they do this thing where they wiggle their fingers on other people. Now, I hate, I loathe, let me change that. I love being tickled. And it's just, is anybody else here just hate it? Oh, thank you. Can't, I trained my three daughters growing up. You know how everybody learns, you know, you know the love languages. People learn the love languages. Well, I had a hate language, and I told them my hate language is to being tickled. You could text them. They will tell you. Say, what is your dad's hate language? They will say, tickling. But in my mind, okay, what is that? You know, it's just kind of a weird thing. But if someone even acts like they're going to tickle me, I get it's fight or flight. I mean, <laughs> don't even talk about it. But my brain has, has just gone down that path. When I was 12 or 13, I got bit by a dog while riding a bicycle. Twice over three weeks. Second time caused a wreck. That's really cool in front of your 12-year-old buddies. But then I got bit doing a visit to somebody's house one time. Had to get rabies shots and everything. So what do you think my thoughts are about dogs? You know, they're out to get me. I know they're carnivores, but my ankle isn't really what they need. The beach. Think of the beach. All right? Just picture yourself on the beach. Pristine blue water that you can see the bottom. It's a sunny day, not too hot, but not cold. Beautiful white sand, and no one else is even on that beach. That's calming, isn't it? It's the calming. I'm going next month, it's in my mind. It's calming, but not always. What if that same beach is where you witnessed your child drowned? Is that going to be calming? No. You're going to feel sadness and grief and just stress and trauma. Feelings are driven by these automatic thoughts at times. Now let's look at neuroplasticity. It's a big word, and we will not stay on this very long. It's the ability for the brain to reorganize itself, to rewire those thoughts. And it was created by God. An example, if you had a traumatic childhood, you may have questions and have learned these questions throughout your childhood and brought them into adulthood. Am I safe? Am I really loved? Am I secure? And those questions become beliefs. I'm not safe. I will never be loved. I'm not secure. And through counseling and through different things we can do, we can rewire our brain to heal from that and think through that. Romans chapter 12, verse 2. Look what it says. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Thoughts. It's important to know that where your thoughts go, there goes your life. What you fixate on, what you ruminate on, what you continue to think about can be the direction of your life. But don't believe everything you think. I have that in my office on the wall, a sign that says, don't believe everything you think. Because sometimes we deceive ourselves. Now, this idea of counsel, or the Bible and psychology, I think, can work well together. And we are seeing that more and more. Let me give you a couple of examples. In Philippians chapter 4, Paul said, whatever's true, think about such things. Whatever's true, think about such things. Excellent, excellent advice. Think the truth. Well, 
in the 70s or whenever it was, somebody made a lot of money creating a theory called cognitive behavior theory, CBT, which is based in thinking the truth. So I think Paul is the original author of CBT and should get some royalties for that. <laughs> in scripture, we are told that sexual relationship should remain within the marriage. Jesus talked about adultery. And this was because it's what's best for us as a couple. But we also know now, through science, one of the purposes of oxytocin is a bonding hormone. That in a sexual relationship, there has a positive loop to that that we attach to people emotionally. If you're going to attach emotionally to someone, why not be your spouse? Isn't that, isn't that awesome that Jesus knew what he was talking about? But if you attach here and there and here and there with different sexual partners, attachment is a little harder to sustain. And finally, um, Jesus knew how to sleep. You know that? He knew how to take care of his mental health. Even in the, the boat, in the storm, all the disciples are freaking out. Who's asleep? Jesus. He's over here sleeping. We look in scripture, he took breaks. They're like, hey, everybody needs healed. He's like, let's go over here and rest. He, sleep was very important. And we're taught about Sabbath and taking breaks and taking care of ourselves. Well, now we know that when we sleep, if we get deep sleep, our brain builds serotonin. Serotonin fights anxiety and depression. You ever been up all night and then super anxious the next day? You haven't allowed your brain to build serotonin. So we see these meld well together. And so we believe, like, through the church and through CDT, that counseling can be biblically sound and also clinically effective. That we can take both pieces and work together on what's best for people's wellness and well-being. Sometimes, just understanding the scripture and just understanding what God has called you to do is what it takes. And sometimes it might mean, because you've got some serious stuff going on, to try a medication. So, clinically sound and biblically effective. All right, let's, well, also, always making sure it aligns with scripture, using scripture as a filter. Let's look at the second myth. Myth number two. Christians shouldn't struggle with mental issues. It's usually a sin issue anyway. All right, we're going to go there on that. I have a quote from a lady named Sherry. It's not a Sherry in this church, so don't look around. But look at this quote. I have bipolar disorder and was counseled by a pastor who suggested I was possessed by demons. Many people have been hurt. I have been in this field counseling for 25 years, and I have heard story after story after story, and I know the other counselors in our office have heard this too. They have been hurt by people, whether they're well-meaning or not, by saying things just like this. We wonder why people walk away from the church and why people no longer want to follow Christ when they've been hurt. I don't know anybody that has changed their life when it comes to struggling with mental health and mental illness issues by being stigmatized and told you're bad and you're wrong. Colossians 3 says, clothe yourself with kindness, goodness, and compassion. And that is the approach we need to take with people that are asking for some help. There are people who, in Scripture who were strong in their faith who struggled emotionally. Jacob, Jonah, uh, Jeremiah was the weeping prophet. Job, Moses, 
Paul himself in the New Testament, he said, I'm overwhelmed and life draws near to death. Heman wrote Psalm 88. He was a stellar man of God, well thought of, a great family man. He wrote Psalm 88. It is the most depressing chapter in the Bible. And at the end, he doesn't even offer hope. He's just expressing his depression. David, let's look at David. David was a king. He was in the lineage of Jesus. He was courageous. He had his struggles, but he was emotional. He had all the feels, right? David, or Psalm 31, verse 9 and 12. Let's look at that. He wrote, Be merciful to me, Lord, for I'm in distress. My eyes grow weak with sorrow and my soul and body with grief. And I know there's people in this room that might be able to resonate with that. I'm forgotten as though I were dead. I've become like broken pottery. So we move to Psalm 44. And you know, he, he was a musician and he wrote this as well. Psalm 41 and 2. I waited patiently, there's the key word, patiently, for the Lord. He turned to me and he heard my cry. He lifted me out of the slimy pit, out of the mud and mire. He set my feet on a rock and gave me a firm place to stand. David was a man who struggled with depression. When you read the Psalms, he also had a lot of anxiety. He was wound up. But you know, when we think of David, the main thing we remember is that he was called a man after God's own heart. And that's an example that we can seek the Lord and love the Lord and strive to love the Lord, but still may struggle at times. We may need to work on our prayer life. You may need to be more consistent and, and grow in your relationship with the Lord. But you also may need to get more sleep. We, may, we all need more Jesus. We all need to really let the Holy Spirit invade our lives and to follow Jesus more closely. But you also may need counseling. Digging deeper in the word and memorizing scripture so we have recall and are able to have the scripture impermeate our life. We may need to do that, but we also may need to look at our nutrition. If you're anxious a lot, why are you drinking caffeine right before you go to bed, right? We may need to take more steps of faith. And one of those steps of faith might be to work through your trauma to rewrite and rewire your thought patterns. Because what's not worked out will play out. I promise you. What's not worked out will play out. We may need to get serious about our faith in certain areas, but we may need medication for something where an emotional issue has a physical source. Can a Christian struggle with mental health issues? Yes. Can a Christian struggle with mental illness? Yes. Can a Christian struggle from having a heart attack? Yes. Sin, though, can worsen a mental health challenge. Talk to anybody who has come out of addictions. They are self-medicating for some pain and trauma almost always and have found themselves in an addiction, the sin of addiction, which can make it worse. So I encourage us to really think through some of those points. So now let's look as we gear towards closing up. What is our response as a church? In Luke 10, let's go back to Jesus. He told the disciples two things. Heal the sick and tell them the kingdom is near. That's it. Heal the sick, tell them the kingdom is near. And I believe sick is not just physical. We do the work of providing care for people, and he will come in and present himself as part of the kingdom. As I said before, we want to see all people through this church thrive in Christ. Brothers and sisters, Christians, 
non-Christians who don't even know who Christ is, and those that are so disillusioned with church, they don't want anything to do with church again, we still want to see them thrive in Christ. And our role is to encourage, equip, and support people. So listen, the church should be the best place to provide healing for the hurting. Do you believe that? the best place to provide hurting and healing. Period. Not just our church service, but you as part of the church, you're part of the body 24-7. You can be agents of healing to people you know by praying with them. And don't just say, I'll pray for you. Pray with them. And one of the best things you can do is follow up. To get a text or a phone call after you've shared with Something with someone is amazing. We need to provide places without shame, without stigma, in confidential and safe places to work through trauma, to work through the struggles we have. We should run to the church when we're struggling instead of running away. Too many times people just disappear because they're going through a hard time and that shame and that embarrassment and they just disappear. We need to go find them. Say, we love you. Can we help you? Run to the people, your brothers and sisters in Christ, because that's what the church was designed to do, the church of Jesus Christ. I sit on a team uh, here locally called uh, Mental Health Matters, and I'm, the team is program directors of adult programs. So basically, there's several of us that are directors of counseling agencies for adults. This is an initiative, and we are looking at all the gaps and barriers in Berthami County. Like, how can we improve uh, services and help to people and work together? So one of the first meetings, the different agencies, we listed on this big board what our agency provides. So all of them, of course, counseling, uh, individual, family, marriage, counseling. Does anybody else have anything else? I said, uh, we got a couple things. And so I said, we have mental health coaches who come alongside people, they're volunteers, and recovery coaches. Uh, we have a Spanish counselor. And then it just started, they said, what else? I started saying, well, we have care communities, which helps um, support adoption and foster uh, homes, we have Embrace Grace, we have support groups and Celebrate Recovery, and it just came out. And they were like, how do you do all that? I said, well, um, volunteers, these are people in our church body that want to serve our community. And how, they said, how do you financially do this? Do you bill insurance? Um, Nope, we do not bill insurance. We provide it at no cost. So then there's faces, you know, and some questions, you know. So I, this is my response. Well, there's about 14 of us, 1,400 of us that pool our resources together to make this happen. And I'm thankful to be a part of a church that embraces this need because we love... Uh, seeing people be restored to who God created them to be. The last 16 months, we had 95 baptisms here through the church. Isn't that amazing? <laughs> 95 baptisms. Well, I took that list and I was thinking, hmm. I looked at all the names, those 95 people, and I thought, I wonder how many of those people first started through counseling at Community Downtown, or Tuesday Connection, or Celebrate Recovery. Those three. Instead of coming to church on a Sunday morning, they first were connected through those three areas. 37% of those 95 baptisms had never stepped foot in a Sunday morning service first. They started through counseling or support. And what that tells me is this is a mission field of our church. And we as a church are partnering together on mission because we want to take care 
and love our community. That is the way of Jesus. At the end of each sermon, I like to put a couple points, action points, and so I've got three here, and I want you to hopefully walk away with at least one of these. The first is this. Think about your mind. Think about your mind. Now, that might be kind of hard to understand the way that's worded. Isaiah 26 says, let's bring that scripture up. You keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. This is Isaiah speaking. But what God is saying is, I will keep you in perfect peace if your mind is on me. It did not say, I will keep you in perfect peace if your mind is stayed on video games all day. I will keep you in perfect peace if your mind is on social media nonstop. Did not say, I will keep you in perfect peace if your mind is on pornography. I will keep you in perfect peace if your mind is focused on Fox News. Nope, there's anxiety for you. Or CNN or any of the other news shows. No, meditate, focus on the Lord. What is feeding your mind? Second thing, don't isolate. We talked about this a little bit ago. If you're struggling, find somebody. Talk to somebody, anybody to get started. And if you're on the other end, make time to listen to people. They need to be heard. Isolation will fuel depression and anxiety in most mental health struggles because you were created for community, for relationships. That is the purpose of the church, that Jesus created us for that need, and it's actually hardwired for connection. Talk to your small group. Now, I was struggling a few years ago with some anxiety where I was, basically, a situation happened, and maybe this sounds familiar, I was predicting the future. I was already down the path of what was going to happen and who's going to do this and what's going to happen. And I'm, I'm just kind of just super anxious. And, it, you know, I was talking to a friend of mine, a close friend of mine, many times about it. And I know him, he knows me. And he said, have you thought about counseling? <laughs> and I thought, hmm, I'm a counselor, but I've never been in counseling. And, but I did, and four or five sessions with a counselor that I know who's a Christian, because a Christian counselor is more likely going to see where God's at work in your life. And he, great advice, simple, help me think things differently. I'm not a fortune teller. I also struggle sometimes with everybody's opinion. Oh, what are they going to think? Preaching this sermon, who's going to be mad at what I say? Who's going to leave the church? I don't know. We all struggle with stuff like that. But I, with some advice, I have a little one-by-one -one card. Now, one-by-one one, small. This little card in my wallet. And I write, I wrote on there, the names of men whose opinion I trust. All right? Now, it's a small list because it's a small card. So when that happens and I start, gosh, what do they think? I go to these men because I know they know me, I know them, they love me, and I love them. And it helps me focus, and they all love the Lord. And the final thing is be honest. Some of us aren't doing well, some of us are, but always be honest, and remember your struggle is not your identity. In your small group, share what's really going on. I heard someone speak one time. If your small group isn't messy, somebody's not being honest. Start your small group this week with that statement and see what happens. You are loved as a child of God and nothing can separate you from the love of God. Nothing. Nothing. Some of you need to remember that. Nothing will separate you from the love of God. And Jesus himself, as we've read in Matthew 11, said... Come to me, 
all of you that are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. So my prayer is that for every person here.